Functions or subroutines are tasks that our program can complete. So you can call a function a subroutine or a subroutine a function. But what I like to do is use the word routine or subroutine. And the reason why I like using that is because we have routines in our daily lives. For example, when you want to make a cup of coffee or make breakfast, you have routines for these things. Or when you want to leave your house, you have a routine for locking all the windows and doors, and making sure everything is secure. You have all sorts of subroutines that you use in your daily lives. And you have these subroutines waiting in your mind, in memory, when you need them. And you just don't need to think about things. But with programming, we need to teach the computer, we need to show the computer how to perform these actions. We need to break down this subroutine, whatever it may be, into a set of instructions. So that is where functions or subroutines come into play. For example, if I want to make a cup of coffee, I have a subroutine for making coffee. And when I think about that, I think about this subroutine that I have where I pour the water into the kettle, I boil the kettle, I tip the water into the mug, then I add my milk and my sugar and so forth. Now also, when I think about this subroutine of coffee, I think of it as adaptable, changeable. So please do understand that even though I have the abstract, making coffee, well, yes, that's on the abstract layer, meaning it's basic. It's very basic way of looking at something, but the instructions need to adapt. So for example, I have a friend that comes over and says, can you make me some coffee? And I say, absolutely. Now making coffee is the same when I'm running that set of instructions when I want a cup of coffee, but my friend also wants a cup of coffee, but it needs to be adaptable. Those instructions need to change. He may have more milk, he may have more sugar, he may have a different combination. And you may have many different friends that all want a coffee, but they want it slightly different from one another. So what you have in programming is the keyword function, this tells the compiler that you want to define a subroutine. You want to create that routine like a routines inside of your mind. Then you need a symbol name. Now, don't forget, if we have something that symbolizes something, it means it's referencing something, it's pointing to something. And we know that symbols are just memory pointers, they're addresses, they're addressing something in memory. So we need to actually give our set of instructions, our list of instructions, a name so we can find it in memory. So once we've done that, then you have the parentheses and the parentheses define parameters. Now, parameters are just variables. They're variables that can have values assigned to them when we execute our instructions. And I'll come back to this in just a second. But you can have as many parameters as you like. Then you have your curly brackets or braces. And in between those braces, you have your set of instructions. These instructions are going to complete that routine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a set of instructions and then you can return something. So when my subroutine is finished, I can return the coffee. Just like when my friend says, could you make me a cup of coffee? I go off in the kitchen, I do the subroutine, I complete it and then I give something back. I return with the cup of coffee. Now, finally, our programs need to be able to invoke these instructions. Now, don't forget, just like in your memory, when we've defined this subroutine, it's just in memory. We haven't actually executed or performed the task yet. All we're doing here is we're defining the execution context. We're defining the instructions to run. However, we are not invoking these instructions until we want to make a cup of coffee, just like this routine is inside of your mind to make coffee. but it's not actually being executed until you want to make a cup of coffee. So for example, we call up the symbol name. Now, you know, when something symbolizes something like an address symbolizes the location to your house. Well, likewise, we have these symbol names and they allow us to address, point to in memory, our instructions that we have defined. So we can call these instructions up and we can invoke them. And we use the parentheses to do this. Also, you need to pass in the values. So how much sugar, how much milk and so forth. These are called arguments. Arguments are values and parameters are the empty boxes or variables waiting to store the data. 
and then we can use this data in the execution of our instructions. It makes it adaptable so that I don't have to write every subroutine out there for different combinations. For example, you've got maybe different amounts of sugar and maybe no milk or maybe milk and sugar. What happens then? Do I have to write a subroutine for everyone? No, because I can pass in arguments, values for each instruction that I want to run, for each cup of coffee I want to make. Therefore, my instructions are adaptable. And that means that I can just write one subroutine that adapts depending on the coffee that I am making. So that's what we have here. We have a subroutine and we have it adaptable by the parameters and the arguments that are placed inside of the parameters. They're just variables. And then once we have finished executing our instructions, we can return. You can, if you want to, you don't have to return an output after all the computation is finished. And also what happens to the parameters is those empty boxes are deleted out of memory. Think of it like we're putting it in the warehouse, but the warehouse needs to be cleaned every now and again. And what we want to do is we want to take these parameters, these variables, and we just want to throw them away. We want to get rid of them in memory. We want to clean the warehouse because we don't want these anymore. We only want the parameters when we're executing the context. Otherwise, what happens is we will fill up memory and we'll be wasting memory because we need to run this subroutine over and over and over again for each friend. But we don't need to keep on storing these values. Once I've made the coffee, it's done. I don't need to say, right, I remember how much sugar's in there now that I give it. No, I don't need it anymore. I can get rid of that data. We always want to make sure that our applications are using as little data as possible or cleaning up ourselves as much as possible. So what happens is once it's finished, these parameters, these variables get deleted out of memory. Now we know that parameters are variables. They're empty boxes waiting for values. And of course, those values can vary when we execute. So we know parameters are variables. We also know that arguments are values. But why do I say arguments instead of values? And why do I say parameters instead of variables? Well, first of all, you've got parameters. If I say, please add this parameter, I didn't need to say to you in that sentence function. You automatically knew because I said parameter, that is a variable defined for an execution context. You know I'm talking in context of a function. You know I'm talking about a function. And also I can say, please pass in this argument. You know I'm talking about a value that needs to be passed in when we're invoking a function. I didn't need to say in that sentence, invoke a function, but you knew immediately because I said argument instead of value and parameter instead of variable that I am talking in context of a function. I'm referring to, pointing to a function. And that is why we don't say variables and values, we say parameters and arguments. So here I have my existing application, which I have the index, and then I have the myapp.js file. And the myapp.js file contains our make coffee function. And in here, you can see we have our parameters, which are just variables that store values. And then we also create a variable inside of the execution context, inside of these curly braces. Now it's important to note that if you create variables or constants and so forth inside of these curly braces, they are also temporary as well. Once we finish, once we've got down to here, we've executed all these instructions, we delete all of the variables, this variable right here, these parameters, all of this gets deleted out of memory and that's it. We just keep the instruction set, that's it. So once we have created this, we create a variable, it just contains a simple string, boil water, that's the very first thing we do. And then we're using the plus equals assignment operator that will concatenate our strings together. So the next string we put together is pour into a cup. Then we add coffee granules. And then I'm doing something interesting here. We say plus equals and then we say add. And then you'll notice I'm using the plus operator again. This is concatenation. But this time I'm not concatenating a string. I'm actually adding in the value. So let's say sugar contains the value of zero. Well, actually what this is gonna do is it's gonna concatenate in the value of zero. So it will convert this into a string and it will turn into one large string. So no spoonfuls of sugar, for example. And there you go, that's all it's doing. So we just need the concatenation. You'll notice the plus is on both sides as well. 
So that's what we're doing in. We're concatenating in the value, the argument that's stored within our sugar parameter into the string. And that's all it's doing right there. So add X amount of spoons of sugar. You can see now it's adaptable. And then also we're going to do the same thing for the milk. And I want a percentage sign. So I'm going to put a percentage sign in there because milk is just going to contain an integer again. So it will say something like add 20% milk. And that's it. That's all it's going to do. So once we've done this, we return the entire string, all of these little pieces that make up our string, our instruction set, will return this entire string by returning this variable, the instructions variable. Now don't forget this variable will be deleted after we have finished executing, but the output, the actual string will be returned and we can do whatever we want with this string once we have returned it. So that's what we ultimately want back from our make coffee function or subroutine. Now, if I go ahead and open up the index page into the browser, and then I also take a look at inspecting it and going to the console, I want to take a look at, first of all, the window object. The window object, again, think of it like the giant warehouse full of all of the little memory pointers that we have. And you'll actually notice that if I was to scroll right down and we keep going, we do have a memory pointer in here for make coffee. There it is. Make coffee is a symbol. It's symbolizing, meaning it's like an address. It's pointing to our instructions in memory. And it is, in fact, a function. So we've got make coffee. There is our instruction set. And now we can invoke this. Now, if I was to just invoke it within my script, so if I was to say make coffee, and then I have to say, right, pass in two sugars and we want 20% milk for my good friend here. And I have to go ahead and save this. What I would do now is try to take a look at this in the browser. So let's hit refresh. And if I open up the browser, nothing happens. So what we need to do is again, export this out to the console. So we're targeting this console interface, this text interface, and then we're logging out. You want to log something, you put it in a ledger and so forth. We want to log out the output, the return from this function, which is the string. So if I go ahead and now hit refresh, and then when I look at this, there you go. It gives me the return. Boil water, pour into a cup, add coffee granules, add two spoons of sugar and 20% milk. It just returns the string and it logs it out to the console window. And likewise, we can actually call it from the console interface because don't forget, it's in memory. It's in that window object. We've got a symbol called make coffee that points to those instructions. And then I can go ahead and say five and maybe I want 50% milk this time. And you can go ahead and keep changing the values so that this is adaptable. And that is what we're talking about with subroutines. We define that routine, it's in our minds, and our minds can adapt this routine depending on what we're doing. And then you can invoke that routine. You can actually perform that subroutine, that action, and then you can keep changing it as you go along. So that is subroutines.